Let's talk briefly about shrews. Of course. Yes. I mean, it's that point in the podcast it is, where the mind shifts to the, the subject of shrews has, and has, other insectivores. And other insectivores. Okay, so let's let's just start there with a brief phylogenetic note from uh, your sponsors, Deep History. Um, so shrews are insectivores, which um, sounds like it's a description of their diet because we have these this language of like carnivore, omnivore, insectivore. Uh, folivore, herbivore, um, but th we are using that term in its phylogenetic meaning. And so, and actually, actually, um, I made a comment maybe last week or, or two weeks ago about the carnivorans with whom we live, and um, that is not a standard use of the term. That is actually, that was a student of ours. Brendan. Brendan, um, who in talking about the difference between ecologically eating meat, being carnivorous, and phylogenetically being part of the lineage from which um, all extant carnivores, uh, being part of the lineage who had a most recent common ancestor from which all extant carnivores, members of this clade belong, those are called the carnivora. But not all the carnivora, not all the carnivora eat meat. There are, for instance, fruit-eating kinkajous, some of my favorites. Um, and there are plenty of things that eat meat that aren't in the carnivora, right? So there are the carnivorans, which include basically the feliform ones, which are like cats and hyenas and weasels and such, and the um, caniform ones, which include dogs and bears and seals and lots of other stuff. Uh, yep, go, so, on. go on. So for people who caught your explanation there, mm -hmm. yep. this will then make sense of the fact that um, snakes – are tetrapods by virtue of the fact that they are in the tetrapod lineage without being quadrupeds, mm -hmm. right? So Even though tetra, and I don't know which is Greek and which is Latin, but tetrapod and quadruped mean exactly the same thing. Right, but um, four, we, four footed. in this family, we segregate these two things so that we can talk about snakes being tetrapods without tripping over it, mm -hmm. um, but quadruped refers to things that actually have four legs. Exactly, so snakes are tetrapods who do not have four legs because they are part of the lineage, tetrapoda. Um, kinkajous are carnivorans without ever eating meat because they are part of the lineage um, that includes um, all of the carnivorans. And there are insectivores, insectivora. Um, and actually, gosh, there's some new Latin name for that clade, I think. I think, uh, I think that clade turns out not to be a clade. It's not a clade. It's paraphyletic. Oh, it's not. So we're talking about the, oh boy. Yeah, so... I don't even remember then who, yeah. who belongs where. Um, but but what shrews... Rest assured, we'll figure it out and get back to you on that. What shrews are not is rodents. They're not rodents. Okay, so um, you know half of all mammals are rodents, more than 2,000 species of rodents on, on the planet. Another quarter of all the mammals are bats, and that leaves every other single thing you can think of that's a mammal in that remaining quarter. And the insectivores, which includes um, shrews, are included in that quarter as well. So shrews... Um, have little tiny heads under the best of conditions. <laughs> um, and it turns out, so there's this, this Polish zoologist, August Donnell. This, this is old news in zoology, and I'm just learning about this this week. And given everything else that's going on, I'm not sure exactly why I was so taken by this, um, but I just kind of can't think, stop thinking about it. August Donnell, this Polish zoologist, um, made the observation back in 1949, he's long since dead, um, that the not just the brains, but the brain cases, the actual skulls of shrews shrink in winter and regrow in the spring. They, are you looking for a shrew skull? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure we I have, have one, one somewhere. I do have one, but yeah. I'm not sure where it is. Um, yeah, we're always misplacing our shrew skulls, yes. aren't we? It's terrible. <laughs> so often. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so that, that it became known as Donnell's phenomenon, the fact that shrews... Um, shrink their brain cases and also apparently their livers and their kidneys and that's amazing but there's something about the brain case itself the literal the skull shrinking by 15 to 20 percent or so in the winter and then regrowing in the spring that's so remarkable but Donnell only observed this he didn't he didn't do what's called a match pairs experiment. He was just looking sort of population-wide and noticing that, um, I, I think it was museum specimens that died in the winter had smaller skulls than those that were um, alive in the spring, that died in the spring and summer. And so maybe this was just about um, selection acting differently on animals that had smaller skulls in the winter and, on, and, on the, and in the summer. But in 2017, um, so again, not 
totally new. Um, we find this published in Current Biology, profound reversible seasonal changes of individual skull size in a mammal. And these guys did the work. They, they tracked individuals, much to the dismay of the shrews, no doubt. Um, oh, where- and to their significant others, who no doubt thought this was kind of cool the first time they heard it. But then dinner time after dinner time, they kept... <laughs> I was certain you were talking about the pair bonded shrews and their significant others. Oh, I can't speak to that. I mean, yeah. I'm so sure they have I, opinions. I, I don't think these shrews are pair bonded. Yeah, I don't no. think so either. No, but the authors here might well be, and I'm sure they were sick of hearing. Is this? Are you? Are you saying to me that you wish I would stop talking about shrews at this point? No, no, no. Not on the all. contrary, I'm imagining that in general, the significant others of these shrew studying biologists were not themselves similarly interested. In our case, no, I'm I'm all for this discussion. Yeah, it's really it's our children who are downstream of our enthusiasm, but we are equally enthusiastic about um, exactly. the, the skulls of shrews shrinking and the um, Zach. Yeah, give me my screen back. Um, so so they actually demonstrate demonstrated it um, for sure. So this uh, this Donnell's phenomenon um, turns out to be true. And apparently there's some evidence, evidence from weasels too, which is fascinating because weasels, as per our conversation, you know, five minutes ago are actually carnivorous. So they're um, not very closely related to shrews. Um, and I guess the, the reason that I am so surprised by this. Yeah, go for it. Here I got it. Um, well, I don't got it, but I got a mm-hmm. piece of it. If I'm remembering my mammalogy correctly, both shrews and weasels do not hibernate. This is absolutely true. So this this has been observed. Uh, the shrews are apparently eating some crazy multiple of their own body weight every every day to yep. to maintain themselves. And in winter, it's harder to come by food, and brains are very expensive to feed. And if you just shrink your brain and not your brain case, and it's going to rattle around in there and not be not be very effective come spring. So you got to shrink the whole thing. Um, so you know, in terms of what the adaptive advantage might be. I, you know, I, I can see that, although it also feels to me like everyone else is also hungry in winter. And if you've now got less brain by which to evade predators, uh, this might be challenging for you. On the other, other hand, shrews uh, emit uh, some odors that make them quite unpalatable to at least uh, mammalian predators. I don't know about hawks and such. I don't, you know, birds, birds have such different sensory. Most birds don't it's traditionally thought, as you know, most birds don't have uh, a very sophisticated sense of smell. There, there are exceptions, right? right. Like uh, vultures, but right. And I don't know about the uh, the you know, like the exhibitors, the hawks and such, um, falcons. Yeah. Um, but the the reason I find this shocking, honestly, is because we have in organismal biology a pretty old. And I actually didn't go and look in the history to see how old our understanding of the terms determinant and indeterminate growth are. But this, what these terms mean is if you have determinate growth, at the point, at some point as you reach adulthood, you hit a size and you do, your bot, your skeleton does not grow anymore. You can obviously grow out. You can always, you, know, you can always get fatter, um, but your, your, um, your long bones don't continue to extend, for instance, right? And, you know, we got sort of three types of skeletal stuff, but I think even the, um, the cranial skeleton really doesn't, you know, just doesn't your, your appendicular skeleton and your cranial skeleton, your, um, and your axial skeleton are all there. And this is, this has been understood to be what mammals have and what birds have determinant growth. There is maybe not a predetermined size because it's going to be affected by things like diet and environment. Uh, but at the point you hit it and some other developmental things happen, you don't keep growing. Compare that to organisms with indeterminate growth, which include most, um, you know, fishy fish, crocodiles, squamates like lizards and snakes, uh, which actually do keep growing um, continuously um, throughout their lives. Now, that rate of growth um, slows dramatically, and it almost looks asymptotic. Like it almost looks like they're approaching some some size at which they will stop, but, but they don't, it seems like they just, they keep growing and that's called indeterminate growth. So if we were seeing this like brain case shrinking in winter and then regrowing again in spring in an organism with indeterminate growth, like a crocodile, that might be scarier than a shrew, but I wouldn't be so shocked by it. Like whatever is going on with regard to skeletal growth and development in like crocodilians 
is clearly different. It's more labile. It's more flexible over the lifetime of the organism than it has been understood to be in mammals. And this thing that we're seeing in shrews suggests at least some mammals have this ability to not just turn back on change in in bone, but actually reverse, actually go smaller. Yeah, which I I just didn't even know this was possible. I'm well, frankly, blown away by it. My guess would be that there's a whole landscape of this stuff that we just don't know yet because it's not that obvious. Hundred um, percent. Yes. And there's you know stuff in the neighborhood, right? Like uh, antlers. You know, antlers are bone. True, true. It's yep. not, it doesn't get resorbed. It gets dropped and mm-hmm. then regrown. But there's some something there. So just a couple things. So, yeah, it's not it's not resorbed, but um, but you do get you know something about male development prompts growth of new bone with a with an ability to then drop them at the end of the season. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um. So one thing I want to point out though is that this actually is reflective of something that you and I have long argued in many contexts, which is that the any hypothesis about brain size that does not include the understanding that brain is the last thing you want to be big without a reason, mm-hmm. right? That any size that you find in, in the brain is there because it served the ancestors uh, whose... Uh, existence caused it. That's very clumsily said, but mm-hmm. the uh, the fact of the brain having grown larger over time cannot be explained by any drift like cause. Because, but, but gee, Brett, I thought we only used ten percent of our brains. <laughs> right, exactly. That kind of uh, nonsensical um, claim just mm-hmm. doesn't stand up to scrutiny because a the brain is so freaking expensive to run, most expensive organ in the body, the size of the brain case makes it vulnerable, right? So the bigger it is, the more likely you are to crack it and die. And, um, it, and it wildly increases mortality for women in childbirth. Wildly increases mortality for uh, women in childbirth. And the, the, and the hip widening decreases stability of walking. Right, you know, forces the baby yeah. to be born early, which causes mm-hmm. a period of helplessness, which is much harder for the parents to deal with. Um, the loss of heat uh, is proportional to the size of the brain. So there, and heat is a, the huge expense. It's mm-hmm. something like 85% of calories for endothermic, that is warm-blooded creatures like ourselves. So the point is the number of things that push in the direction of, geez, if you can get away with a smaller brain, then do it, yeah. is huge. So to Be any... a pinheaded shrew if you can. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, be a pinheaded shrew if you can. Now there's advice for you. Mm-hmm. We'll all take that one into 2021. Um <laughs> But anyway, so this does suggest that there's intense enough pressure on these things that even within an individual, a seasonal opportunity to shrink the brain, however that works, is a good thing. Yep. And that selection has found it, uh, it sounds like, maybe twice. In, uh, maybe twice, yeah, um, which which then, of course, raises the question of like, really, just twice? Are we sure? Right, and it right. probably <laughs> won't be. But then here's the question. I want to know, you know, the thing about the brain is it's not like more is good right? Mm -hmm. More is good by virtue of how the neurons are connected to each other. So exactly what way are these creatures economizing and then rebuilding? What sort of structure is it that they can rebuild a brain that's of any use at all? Yeah. Right? What, are, what, are they, what are they losing access to? Right. Like what can't they well, do in the winter that they can do in the summer? I had a guess and about that. Yeah, I actually, okay. So, so you, do you I, have it? Yeah, it's a little bit poorly formed, but I got it in my head. Yeah. So- I had two things. One mm-hmm. is maybe they're not losing the neurons. Maybe they're basically collapsing the structures intact. So there's a weird uh, result in um, development where the cells of the baby are present long before they are fully infused with resource, right? Mm-hmm. And so the point is the resource, you don't want to put the resource, pregnancy is dangerous. And you don't want to put the resource at risk before you have to because that's, you know, a penny saved is a penny earned, uh, metabolically (laughs) speaking. Um, And so uh, is it possible that the brain is being shrunken in size that basically, you know, the... the, Wait, but they're still walking around. Well, right. Obviously, there are lots of parts of it that won't be, but are there sets of circuits... As opposed to fully lost. Right. right? As opposed to Mm -hmm. lost and then regained, which is mighty hard to imagine how that could be productive 
Um, it, it is. Um, on the other hand, uh, we know that, for instance, migrating songbirds literally lose their testes and regrow a pair mm -hmm. upon landing in their northern migrating, their, their northern breeding grounds. Yeah. Um, because carrying around balls is too, is too heavy to fly with for these birds. And so, you know, the thing that I was wondering about shrews is, is whatever, you know, if it's lost rather than shrunk down or either way, really, yeah. um, it's partially going to be about sort of whatever the shrew equivalent of mating and dating is, you know, that they don't need in the winter. Exactly. That was going to be my hypothesis also was that there was a whole, uh, you know, complexity surrounding reproduction that, you know, you're not going to need. But again, yeah. I wouldn't imagine it would be uh, lost. I would imagine it would be put Shrunk into down. cold storage as it were. Um, <laughs> yeah. But in <laughs> no. passing, you just blew right by oh, no. regrow a pair. Oh no. I, I, yes, but, I know regrow a pair now that is mm -hmm. an insult perfect for an era in which so many people are losing their ability to say normal things in the face of a crowd of people shouting at them and i i think i'm going to start telling people to regrow a pair oh i i have actually i have i've begun doing that occasionally yeah yeah that's a good one mm -hmm. it's a good one i like it yeah um yeah it has broader applicability than if you are a, a bird landing in his northern breeding grounds I think there are a lot of contexts right. in which regrow a pair is In that uh, case, you're just being advice. supportive. <laughs> That's right. Regrow a pair, right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, yeah. I mean, if mm -hmm. the right bird looked at you and said, regrow a pair, you know, that'd be a good sign. Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, yeah, get on with it, buddy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Get on with it. Exactly. After the live stream ended during our intermission, I oh, did so long ago. immediately locate my shrew skull, which is here. And really, I'm not sure you'll get very much out of... Um, seeing it it's but what you will on. get is that we are the kind of podcast <laughs> that has a shrew skull mm -hmm. when needed for demonstration purposes what else do you have in there uh i believe this is a hippo sidereid skull oh, this is a bat. no one else has a hippo sidereid skull I'm other thinking, podcasts may have a shrew skull but a hippo sidereid skull yeah, i don't think so take that smarter every day um, so a hipposidera, you've said it and I talked over you, is a it's chiropteran. A, it's a yes, bat. Yes, it's a bat. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, a horseshoe bat. And then here we have a uh, phylostomid. Another bat. Yeah, Another this is micro -bat. a leaf nose bat. These, these are the guys that I studied. You can tell from the skull that the leaf nose is soft tissue, not skeletal. Yep, absolutely <laughs> can. All right. Well, that was fun for me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> me, me too. Moxie apparently had enough and has She's left. She's done. Yeah. She's hit the road. The other two, the boy cats are here though. They're, they're working through their cream.